Thanks very much, everyone, because it's so fantastic for my ego to have a room full of people. I wanted the whole room, this will do. This little room will do. So um, I'm Maxine Drake, I'm an advocate. And I started my working life in the AIDS area when the AIDS crisis first hit. And I was a baby dyke back then. And the gay community seized the HIV AIDS debate and really ran with it. And that was, in a sense, the, my formative years. And um, some of it's come back lately as a, you know, really hit me hard with, I suppose, the recollections of some of the trauma and a bit like being in a war zone back then. But, um, but that's what made me in a way, and being gay also made me, because um, you have to you have to go through a, a fair identity formation wow. process, and it gives you an enormous sympathy for other people who are struggling in life, and so that's probably part of that. But yes, sir, I actually didn't even know I was going to stand up and yap, because usually my heart rate goes up, and I tell them, oh, say something. But I just did it anyway, so there you go. I've come out now twice, and obviously a big attention seeker. <laughs> And Jack rang me ages ago and said, Max, Max, what are you going to say at our session um, at the, the, the family leadership conference? And I mulled over in my, I was sitting in the garden, I was really working on it hard in my head, and I thought, oh my God, the only, the only name I can give for this session is Nonstop Negotiating. But then I remember my father's mate had written a book called Nonstop Negotiating. And I rang him and said, John, you know that book you gave me? Um, I haven't read it, but what's the pitch? <laughs> oh, they said, it's about this, it's about this. Oh. He'd written a book and said, the best way to get to do a tour is to write a book, then you can do the tour to sell the book. And so, um, so non-stop negotiating is the term I came up with. I'm an advocate, and I do advocacy. And when I first met a family, a group of families, I thought, I have, I, I, I'm, I'm not a legitimate member of this group because I haven't lived the experiences that lots of people have lived. But as I heard the stories, I realised that there was some skills I gathered as an advocate that would have given me some capacity to help them to hustle. Because what advocates do is we hustle. We use bluff, we use a kind of um, pretend reverence. <laughs> we, we are, um, I'd say that I'm at conflict averse, but conflict ready. Ready to jump in if I need to. One of the tests I'm putting myself under at the moment as an advocate is, um, and I think it's a test we all need to do for ourselves as adults is when something feels wrong, how do we call it out? When something feels wrong and our instinct tells us, geez, that's wrong, how do we call it out instead of thinking about it on the way home in the car and thinking, oh, shit, I wish I'd said that. How do we call things out? Because I think we have a natural tendency to, to think, oh, maybe I'll get it wrong, maybe I'll upset them, maybe I'm not actually right, maybe I'm just angry, but how do we call it out? So good, I'm practicing it. But um, so I, in my working life, I'm an official visitor into the mental health system. So I suffered hugely this morning from listening to the story about relationships and knowing that when I go into psych facilities, I shouldn't talk about it now because I'll just speak now. I sit down with a person who the staff have said, oh, he's really dangerous or he's really, he's just not here. And I sit down with somebody and I just engage. I try to be friendly and authentic because I'm not a clinician. I'm just there in a sense as a human rights monitor. And I can get into an exchange with somebody. I can, I can, they come to me. We, we can, I can find them. But when I see the clinicians engage, they're just engaging through the lens of psychiatry and symptomatology and they're not connecting with them as people and it infuriates me. But maybe I've got to go back and start to maybe explore that a little bit further. So, um, one of the things I wanted to say is a follow-on from Laura's presentation, and then I'll start mine to prop up. I'm going to get some water. I don't know whose it is, but I'm okay with that. <laughs> Bring it on, I say. Come to me, germs. I think one of the things that moves us as human beings at a really particular level is, is human rights that are being breached or being ignored or unfulfilled. And it's often we don't know what human rights we even have until they've reached, yeah? And, and I think that part of Laura's excitement about her activities, Laura's just, so there's a new, people who are new here, Laura's the academic who's come who, to talk to us about the fantastic program that's being run at East Edith Cowan University to um, educate people in um, 
How do we better communication partners for people who can't communicate through conventional means? And um, I was at an advocacy moment with a family when one of these, a person who's a unique, who's a really skilled communication partner was talking about being with a young boy when he was terminally ill, very close to death, and he, she said they spent the whole day struggling for him to express to her the question he wanted asked. He wanted to ask of a doctor and a nurse and of Google, does it hurt to die? Yeah, that's the question this nine-year-old kid wanted to ask. And she, this communication gal was, was, was incredibly moved and privileged to be able to answer, to support this child to ask this question and find an answer to it. But what I also saw her in, in her was that, that impatient rage you get <coughs> when you know that if, oh my God, what if all of the kids that are dying want to ask this question? What if there's nobody who can help them answer it? What if there's, there's people around them who just go, yes dear, did you want me to put Pingu on again? You know, duh. And, and she was really frustrated because she thought, we need this. And that's why I think Laura's very excited about this communication course because what it's doing is it's, it's, it's the mechanism for helping people to have their human right to be able to communicate expressed. And I think that's what we're in the move, we're in this environment now. We are, um, we are human rights advocates in a sense and we are in a liberation movement and that's why it's so exciting <coughs> and you're allowed to feel moved yeah and you're allowed to 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 feel angry and to feel invigorated and excited and and to feel hopeful and that's what i think that this movement gives us but anyway what i'm here to talk about is <laughs> so and i want to use my whiteboard but the camera won't let me but i will so as i said i'm an advocate um I remember once um, Ted Wilkes is a, a Noongar elder here in Western Australia. He said in a meeting that I was at, um, the Noongar people need non-Aboriginal people of good intent to stand beside us to help us in our battle. We can't do it by ourselves. The gay community <coughs> needs the straight community to help it achieve its goals. Yeah, that if it was just us, you know, waving our flags and marching in our G-strings on the street would never get marriage equality. We need everybody to help us with that. And I think that's what we also need to work on with um, in, the, in the disability community. And that's one of the reasons I feel like I have a place here. And, um, but I also know that I'm other. And I think, thanks Darl. I think that um, there's times when it's sacred for people who are of a particular tribe to be together. And I think that it's really great that we have service providers here. Um, but there's so, always times that I think, and I don't know, Joe, you might agree with this or not, that, that families have complete private time to work on stuff and say whatever they need to say without anybody else around, without tiptoeing around egos and vanities. So one of the things I thought this morning is that, oh my God, this conference has been so... So positive. So, there's no service bashing going on at all. Next, you might be the first one to do some, some service bashing. We'll do it later. Hey? We'll do it later. We'll do it later. In your um, advocacy session, because um, I think that there's some really important things that need to be said about advocacy and or about um, services. <laughs> Done with the attention? It's not no, about no, you, it's yeah. about me. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I'm just trying um, to make it more about you. You got your whiteboard now and the camera. Go for it. Okay, yeah, I do. <laughs> <laughs>
contumelious, it's, it's fuller expression, contumelious is to be sub insubordinate, to be, to be too uppity. And what I realised I encountered with a lot of clinicians particularly is if somebody asks one question, Whoa. ask two or ask three, you're starting to be really insubordinate and you're starting uh. to, to really uh. piss them off and, tip, try and, and not, not respect the, Im the imbalance of power. I think a lot of relationships expect an imbalance of power. And that an advocate um, is often in a situation of having to, um, to challenge power. And so we started to talk in the, the groups, in the, um, the work we were doing here about um, teaching people advocacy skills. And I thought that, um, I've decided that, I think I'll just, just do a couple of things. One is, one is I think advocacy is about an escalation of pressure. An escalation of pressure. And you start with the absolute minimum that you need to apply. The absolute minimum of pressure you need to apply in a situation to try to get an outcome. And I think in the work, I'm rushing now, I'm doing a complete Laura. I've got so many things I want to say, I'm completely rushing, and I'm sorry, I think it's too much. Slow down. Slow down and take it easy. You're here for the duration. Good on you. I love for that. So if you're going to bless, give me that blessing. Wow. One of the things I've learned here in this um, is about the natural authority of families. I think one of the things we fail to claim is the natural authority of families. And I think that, um, I think maybe service providers and advocates have taken up some place in all of that. And I think we need to get out of that space. And I think that um, <coughs> you might bring an advocate in down here when you have a bit of a problem. But I think most of the time people are dealing with things themselves and advocacy is often about an incident of engagement where there's a high degree of conflict. But the parents who have people who are, have um, complex needs don't have the privilege often of raising a complaint because they're constantly in engagements with services. They're constantly constantly dealing with services and a complaint is a bit of an indulgence. And so families have to, if there's an affront from an encounter with a service, they just have to cop it sweet often, bury it and move on and continue in their negotiations with a service that they may or may not have any respect for and it's um, it's a unique kind of suffering, I think. But if you have a, um, anyway, I'm just gonna go into. So Taryn, I've asked Taryn to critique my presentation already. Is 
exquisite strengths that families develop are utterly unrecognised by those outside the environment. Some text, I like once I met a guy who was in, he was in prison, no, he was in the psych, the super, super the psych supermax, maximum security ward of um, Greylands for a number of years. And I thought, nobody has told this guy that the fact that you've survived this system is extraordinary. It's utterly extraordinary. And if you wanted to put the skills that you've developed on a CV, yeah? Resilience, endurance, existing with people you'd never otherwise mix with, all sorts of shit. And I reckon if we could do some of that for families, we could identify some exquisite strengths that you need to put in the face of the other side. Service providers, when it comes down to it, let's, let's, let's do this, when it comes down to the crunch, yeah, that's where the loyalty line lies. I call that the loyalty line, that when it's tested, they might say they're here for the person that you love, but when it's tested, the loyalty line lies there, okay? And no criticism to the people on this side, of course they go off for annual leave, of course they get sick, of course they choose another job somewhere else, yeah? They move, all that kind of stuff. They're aimlessly renewing themselves with new people, but you're not. <laughs> and so, this, that's... The other thing I think that in this kind of dynamic in, the, in terms of advocacy and negotiation, when things get tough and there's a meeting, there's going to be lots of them, yeah? So one of the conclusions we've drawn in some of the work we've done is to never go to a meeting alone. Never go to a meeting alone. The authority I bring to that statement is that I'm an advocate. I'm an independent third party who's gone into settings with other people and just my existence has changed, made a transformation in the dynamic. If you think about the health setting, what have you got? A clinician behind a desk and a patient. Established dynamic. We know where the power rests there, but add somebody else. Yeah? Especially if they don't know if you're a lawyer or whatever. Make <laughs> <laughs> them nervous. I'm a cyclist and I like nervous drivers and I like nervous doctors because it focuses their mind. <laughs> and it changes the dynamic. But whenever there's anything of any great attention or in a negotiation, they will stack. They will stack the room. And so you need to stack on the other side. You never go to a meeting alone. The Side by Side Project has got a, a little training course on how to be that other person. So say it's the family member, and then they have a family partner beside them. And there's a course on how to do the, how, you, how you do that. And I think that um, one of the things we teach in this course is posture. I am all bluff. I'm Maxine Drake, 99% bluff. Some bone and some blood and some flesh, yeah? I'm really hoping it doesn't run out before I die because I don't know what will be left. <laughs> because in fact, posture is bluff, but posture is also, it's an expression of this, yeah? Poor posture is an expression of diminished power. Posture is attitudinal, posture is speech, posture is in your body. And I say that one of the things if we can only teach how to hustle, it's in posture. An attitude. And so one of the things that happens when you take people along with you in these negotiations is they get more skilled, you get more skilled. The other beautiful thing you get in this kind of dynamic is the beautiful thing that the um, Aboriginal culture teaches us is this notion of reciprocity. Yeah? That if you've asked somebody to help you, they can ask you to help them. If they've asked you, then you've got, a, you've got a credit up the sleeve to call on if you need it. And when you're in a desperate situation, you're running through the card file, Martin, and you just think, oh, shit, man, I could ask so-and-so to come on Wednesday. Yeah? And so that's what we talk about, because it is all about power. And it's all about the fact that most of us are conflict-averse. Most of us, most of us kind of rely on the other guys to do the right thing. But that kind of implies that they know themselves well, the fact that they, you know, we rely on too many factors on their side to deliver a good outcome. So what we need to do is make sure that on this side we're dealing um, with the most, in a way, the most powerful way we can. Now, any transactions in the, co 10 minutes, 5 minutes? Okay. Cool, I'm okay with that. 
Um, one of the things you know that in the commercial domain, um, we're negotiating something, um, a transaction. I did it recently, I moved house, plugged in the washing, brand new washing machine, and it shot, sh shorted the house out, you know? It's a really annoying, inconvenient, can make you grumpy, but it can generally be sorted. It doesn't generally engage your heart, you know? It doesn't make you, doesn't deal with in outrage, and it is just a washing machine. When you're dealing with human services, when you're dealing with human services, it's a different, completely different dynamic than commercial engagement. And it taps into so many of our, um, our vulnerabilities in terms of negotiation. And so I think um, one of the gorgeous things we've all loved about today is seeing, seeing fathers, and, fathers and mothers here. And I think that in the, in the negotiation dance, there's, um, there's a fantastic role for um, other family members in these kinds of settings. And um, somewhere the other day, somebody said, it really pisses me off. When he comes with me, they listen to him. Yeah, really pisses me off. And I said, let's not look at this in feminist terms, yeah? Let's look at this in just... Oh. In purely societal terms, that just like having gorgeousness get up this morning, Markham, yeah? Markham's, Markham's unique socialization as a male in this world and his capacity to face that and to face the situation he's in moves us in a very particular and unique way. Let's not analyze it too much. It just moves us in a particular way. Men and the way they, what they bring into these such situations is unique and special. We need them. We need the gorgeous dudes we've got here. I think you two are, you two are support workers? Yeah. We need gorgeous young men. They even be gorgeous together. We need young men bringing maleness into the support world to do things in male ways. Because us women, we talk too much. You know, we, we analyze things too much. We blah, blah, blah. Whereas guys can say, Gym? Yep. Off they go. They don't need much more than that. So we could go to the gym, or we could go to the gym, or we could go for coffee afterwards. Yeah, but if we go for coffee afterwards the gym, then maybe we'll need to have a shower. It just goes on and on and on. Whereas guys are so much more economical. And, um, <laughs> and so guys need guys, you know? Some of us gender vendors need it both. <laughs> but um, I think we have, to, we have to make it safe for men to participate as well. And I think that men can bring unique unique dynamics into these settings and um, and that we have to do more work on this. We need to do more work on this, um, but in the context of, I think all the, <laughs> that's not really wanky, but all the things we've talked about in the last two days. Because this is what we're here, this is a really exciting time for all of us and we're lucky to have come to this conference and it's going to be a, um, it's going to be a springboard for lots of really good and interesting things and I'd love for us to explore this kind of thing more and I'd like the backing of people who with influence in the systemic domain, Taryn, to, um, to help us carry this on because um, it's going to be, you don't need, I think there might be a time if you have critical situations and you need to throw a curveball like me into the mix. You need advocates to do that, but you don't need that often. Have faith in what you can do yourselves. Get the skills. Never imagine you have to have an advocate. Yo. I've worked in an advocacy agency. I go to a school meeting on my own. They will ignore what I say. I bring my LAC along, and she just basically sits there, and if they ask questions to her, and she goes, what do you think, Kerry? And I give the whole spiel. Then it gets all noted and documented. Now, I am an advocate, or previously been an advocate, yet they won't listen to me without that professional hat on. How do we get around that situation as parents? 
Well, my question I wrote on the board over there is that is the notion of um, the natural authority of families a contested one? Do we need to do some more work on this? Because it should not be. This is what's offended me most in the past. I ring up, I'm actually American Health Institute Council, I ring on behalf of um, so and so, and I'm wondering about blah, and they tell me, and I think, you wonder why you're telling me this. This person's been ringing you for days for this information, and you've told me a stranger just because I'm throwing my weight around and I'm bunging on some kind of posture. So I don't quite know about that. That's something we can work on. Yo. Yes, it's my LECD. I have a daughter with six disabilities, and um, she's uh, on with one of the providers. Uh, before she went to that provider, we already did a care plan and already highlighted all her highs and lows and what she's good at and what she's good at and have the whole booklet with. Then they made their own care plan, trying to normalize my daughter. Yeah, I was maybe you talking about the normalizing. And yeah. I was so surprised, oh, because her, even though she's 24, but her eyes uh, really, you know, because she's also got cerebral palsy. So she's really like, she's already done um, all the testing. And so are you, are you gonna tell me you've had experience with an advocate in that setting? Yeah. Or? No, no, I'm talking about the providers. So anyway, mm -hmm. I've been telling them that this is her age limit. Don't make her like 24 years old. I have to act like a young lady because She's also got uh, autism and a Tourette syndrome. The more you try to make her normal, the more she's like this. Okay, thanks Thanks for that. So you've got issues with the service provider and, you're, yes. and you, then you're seeking advocacy, is that what you're saying? Well, the only thing oh, they you listen. You're the LIC. Yeah. Okay. The so only thing they will listen and do, uh, you know, like, well, listen, if I email to them and ask for services or whatever, if I, Thank you, uh, you know, I uh, CC her the email. Mm -hmm. but well, no, but that's, yeah, that's okay. Because I would say, in the escalation of pressure, they're just strategies you use. Mm -hmm. There's ways and ways that you do it, and there's going to be pushback, and then there's a moment where you need to convene something that moves things along. And so this is this is the natural kind yeah, of course. The only thing they listen. If now, you. We, can I just say, yeah, I'll come back to you in a second, Melissa. For a long time, I thought we need an advocacy service in education. We need, we need, when I was working at the Health Consumers Council, I was going in and out of appointments with people and it made a little difference in all of those circumstances. And I thought, should we need this in schools? Yeah. We need this in schools because you can't send it up to the regional office. You can't formalize it in a complaint. You just need a moment of intervention from an outsider who can move things along. And Taryn's given me the opportunity to do a couple of bits of that recently in the education system, two minutes to go. And so I've always, we've always thought we need an Education Consumers Council. It's one of those things we need to keep pushing. We need more voices on that. But, um, but still, I would think you need the advocate occasionally, but mostly you should be taken seriously as the parent in those negotiations. So I'm yeah, it always upsets me that that's the reality. Anyway, I'm going to wind up because I told him I'd finish in a minute early. So <laughs> sorry for my awkward, kind of excitable start. Melissa, yeah, don't, just, sorry, I'm carry on. Bit no, I just want to share something that you said to me when we met before that was a game changer for us, was don't over-explain yourself. Like you said, in that setting, like these girls sound like they're having this exact problem. I would over-explain myself, justify myself. You don't have to. You don't have to justify yourself to them. And don't tell them who your advocate is. They don't need to know, unless they are. <coughs> it could be anyone, but don't say this is my mum. Don't say it's just my mum. It's just my mum. Yeah. yeah, you let just your name and, and say all this is Sarah, she's come here as my family partner, yeah. and she's taking notes, and tell her, be open in front of her. Yeah, yeah this is the bluff. kind of the bluff. This is a scripting we do in, in the, fam in the um, family partner's activity, and it's a really clever stuff. It's just playing with, playing the yeah, game and well, playing it differently. Really well. So thanks very much for your grace in my clumsy start and um, we just keep, it's a conversation. All of this is a continuous conversation I'm really proud to be part of it. Thanks very Thank much. You.